Ah, uh, yeah. Welcome in. Welcome back to another episode of Format Podcast, Saturday Night Live. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And tonight is yours truly, me, Mr. B, Bruce Hope, and I am going to be holding it down solo. Um, my guys had some stuff to do, so um, I don't normally do the Saturday Night Lives uh, by myself, as you know. But I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to I'm going to do that tonight and uh, should be fun, should be fun. So what I'm going to do first is uh, I'm going to chill for a few minutes here. Uh, wait till we get some people in the chat. Then we are going to go ahead and we're going to set it off. And we got some uh, pretty interesting topics for you. So um, let's take a few minutes and uh, let's hang out. And um, yeah, while I while I watch the end of this Florida LSU game and watch the Gators put the finishing touches on the LSU Tigers and uh for those of you who know me, you know I'm not an SEC guy, but I will say, go Gators, right? Definitely. And uh, I'll, I'll break that down to you in a few minutes why I feel that way about it. But, um, yeah, we'll just chill for a few minutes, and then, then we'll get it popping. Yeah, Brian Kelly does not look happy, and I can always enjoy that. There we go. All right. All right. All right. Ooh, Gators got seven sacks tonight. That is, that's vicious. I like that though. I like that. Go Gators for tonight. <laughs> um, let's see. Yeah, we'll just wait a couple more minutes. Uh, see, see if we can get a couple more people in the chat. Then I'll. Go ahead and uh, do my thing, and uh, we will have some fun talking some sports tonight. So let's uh, let's let's see what's going on. We'll just wait another minute or two, and then we'll get started. <clears throat> In case you're wondering what I'm doing while I'm waiting, I'm just uh, sitting here watching the end of this uh, Florida LSU game. Um, very happy about that. Obviously, Notre Dame is over. They won, so I'm great there. But uh, this is a little bit of icing on the cake, and then uh, – I'll have uh, Georgia and Tennessee on for, while I'm uh, while I'm uh, broadcasting with y'all. So definitely um, should be a good night. Should be a good night. Salam, Sneed was good, my brother. Good to see you, brother. How are you, man? Good to see you. Transformer, you know better, man. You better go to YouTube and hit that like button. <laughs> you know better, bro. <laughs> Come on now. Uh, let's see. All right. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, before we get started, you know what time it is. I'm going to hit my little thing and then we'll, we'll get it. If you're here on YouTube and you haven't already, please make sure you go ahead, click that like, that subscribe, that notification bell. Make sure you're kept up to date whenever we drop new content on the channel. If you want the audio only version of the podcast, open up your audio podcast platform, hit the search bar, type in the format podcast, and we should come right up if you're enjoying the content make sure you give us that like that five star review and drop a comment all that stuff helps us rise in the algorithm helps us find more sports fans helps more sports fans find us and finally make sure you write it down put it in your phone set an alarm do whatever you got to do to remember saturday nights at 7 p.m we are live here on the format podcast and we'll give you the opportunity to call in talk to us get at me i love it i can't i can't wait i can't wait all right so um uh, shouts to everybody who's here, man. I appreciate y'all. Um, yeah, let's get it going. So, uh, we got some good, uh, topics tonight. I think, uh, definitely should enjoy it. Um, first, obviously, uh, as you can see by the rundown, we're going to talk, uh, Tyson and the Netflix dud. That was a interesting situation. And, 
uh, a not so interesting fight. Um, then we'll go go to the NBA. We'll talk about the undefeated Cleveland Cavaliers and uh, are they not getting as much love as they deserve? Uh, we will talk about LeBron James, my <laughs> arguably least favorite player ever. But we got to give him his flowers where they're due and talk about the fact that he is still at it at a tremendous pace for somebody who's been around so long. Uh, and then finally, we'll uh, finish it up with the uh, the NFL and uh, talk a little bit about who is the best team in the NFC. Um, <laughs> Bruce, Bruce, what's good, bro? I'm going to get to that, man. I'm definitely going to get to that. Um, I, it's not going to be a whole topic, but I'm definitely going to talk about it. And it's funny, I was talking to my homeboy about it earlier, and I, I mentioned that exact thing that I can't wait to hear uh, what he has to say about it on uh, on Monday on his show. So, yeah, I'm going to get to that. Somehow, man, you, you're always a step ahead of me on these topics, man. But I appreciate the love. All right. So um, let's get started with some some quick hits first. All right. So the first quick hit, as I mentioned, while I was kind of waiting for some people to get into the get into the um, into the chat here. I'm a big college football fan. As you all know, I am a diehard Notre Dame fighting Irish fan. And Notre Dame continues to do what they've been doing uh, for the most part all season. They have been dominating the weaker teams on their schedule. And that's what the good teams do, right? The really good teams dominate the weaker teams that they play. They beat Virginia today, 35 to 14. I think they were up, um, they were up 28 nothing at half. So kind of disappointing that they didn't uh, score more and really uh, run it up on them in the second half, and not run it up on them in in terms of being unsportsmanlike, but run it up on them in terms of you know college football, the whole eye test, and you got to impress the committee with big wins and all this nonsense. So you got to do it how you got to do it. But uh, Marcus Freeman has this team playing really well, especially after that terrible uh, week two loss to uh, Northern Illinois. And realistically, that's probably uh, the worst loss of any playoff contending team in the country. And Notre Dame is still paying for that, but. They have done exactly what they should have done ever since then. They have taken it one game at a time, one week at a time. What do we say? Go 1-0 and every week, and that's what they've been doing. And they've got two weeks left to do that. They've got Army next week, which could be a tougher matchup than they anticipate, obviously playing those uh, service academy teams with that triple option, uh, wing T, uh, veer type offense is very difficult to defend, takes a lot of eye discipline, a lot of uh, really good film study. And the fact that they're so different, uh, offensively from every team that you will play from the rest of the season makes it even more difficult to uh, deal with. But they have to go out there and they have to get it done. And then they will finish up at USC, who I'm sure a lot of people thought would be a lot better this year, but aren't. So Notre Dame has two games left. They win those both of those games, and they may have a legitimate chance to host a playoff game in the first ever 12-team playoff in the first round. So this this could get very interesting. So that's Notre Dame. That's that quick hit. I'm not going to get too much into it. Uh, second quick hit. Uh, as my main man Bruce mentioned, Colorado Buffaloes. Um, some of you have been here with me for a while. Some of you are newer. Last year on this very show, I said that Colorado coming into the Big 12 had a legitimate chance to win the conference. And here they are with a legitimate chance. I think they need two more wins and they will play for the Big 12 conference championship. And with that offense and with the way the defense is rounding into form and really playing well, under defensive, uh, I think, assistant D-line coach Warren Sapp. Um, you see them really getting after the passer. They're doing a better job stopping the run. You know, uh, no one's going to mistake them for Georgia defensively, but that is a really a much improved, I should say, defensive football team. So uh, they're doing that. We know the offense, when they get going with Shadur Sanders and Travis Hunter and the rest of those weapons can be a real laser light show. You just got to keep uh, Shadur Sanders upright. And I believe that by far he's the best quarterback in the country. I believe that by far out of all the quarterbacks coming out this year, he will have the best NFL career. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Um, I believe by far he's better than every quarterback that came out last year. That should tell you how high I am on Shadur Sanders. I think the guy is that freaking good. But with all of that said, I do believe, and I said it last year, as I mentioned, Colorado has a legitimate chance to win the Big 12. If they do that in their very first season in the Big 12, in Coach Prime's second season as head coach of Colorado, in just the third season since Colorado was 1-11 and overall, with an average loss, uh, with an average uh, uh, point differential of minus 29, they will have made the college football playoff. Is that not a story? Is that not a story? And, and Bruce, he mentioned uh, Jason Whitlock. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Jason Whitlock. He is a, uh, well, Bruce said it. He, he, he is not a big fan of Coach Prime. Uh, he doesn't like the way Coach Prime does things, and that's his prerogative. Uh, but also, um, he, you know, he's been consistently ripping him on his show. And 
Jason Whitlock, uh, he's an African-American longtime uh, sports writer and journalist. And now uh, he hosts a, I'll say, a very conservative uh, show on YouTube, which he has some sports talk. He mixes that in with some uh, political talk, so on and so forth. And I'm not going to get into that, but I will say um, he's not a, a lot of African-Americans aren't huge fan of his, fans of his. I won't say where I am in my stance on that, but I will say that uh, Jason Whitlock, again, he he's the guy who carries the water for the right. That said, I think there's nothing wrong with being able to listen to both sides, whether you agree or not. Right. You can always learn from people, whether it's learning not what to say, learning not what to do, um, whether or not you uh, agree with people. You can always still learn something somehow. Right. So anyway, Jason Whitlock, he's been kind of banging on Coach Prime since uh, last season. And uh, it's going to be funny because he has had to, as this season has progressed, begrudgingly admit that Coach Prime has done an outstanding job. He hasn't used the word outstanding, but I'll, I'll put that in for him. An outstanding job in building up this Colorado program and, and having a great deal of success with it. So it's kind of funny. That's why I'm saying like uh, Monday morning, I will be excited to hear his show and hear what he has to say about it. In these situations, it's funny to hear each week what somebody has to say when they're kind of forced to eat crow, right? All right, so there's that. And then finally, uh, the third part of this quick hit when it comes to college football is uh, <laughs> Brian Kelly, former head coach of Notre Dame Fighting Irish, left the team three years ago. Uh, yes, this is Marcus Freeman's third year. So he left the team three years ago and he went to quote unquote greener pastures. Right. What does he mean by that? He went and became the head coach of the LSU uh, Tigers in Baton Rouge, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, in the SEC. And so. He left there and everyone was applauding. And first of all, I'm not sure why when everyone knows that he was LSU's second choice, they wanted Lincoln Riley, but they only grabbed him because Lincoln Riley shunned them and went to USC. But that's a different story. Anyway, uh, what's up, Steve? Man, you, you're on one tonight already, I see. So anyway, um, Brian Kelly goes to LSU and everyone's talking about, oh, he wanted to go where the big boys play and he wanted to go where he would have a chance to win. And, uh, you know, he wanted to go, well, really where he wanted to go was a place where he didn't have to do the work to recruit because in that part of the country, right, uh, everyone in Louisiana grows up playing football, wanting to play for LSU. So the recruiting is almost done by itself. And then, you know, you have that small area if you want to get out, maybe grab a, a couple of Florida guys, a couple of Georgia guys, some Mississippi guys, some Alabama guys, right? But for the most part, your recruiting is covered by itself. And then, of course, you know, you don't have the – strenuous academic conditions <laughs> for the student athletes at LSU versus a place like uh, Notre Dame. Obviously you have the weather advantage. So Brian Kelly, he thought he was just going to walk into it. Everything was going to be gravy and that he would be, you know, he would be all good, but uh, he hasn't been able to get it done yet. Now he did get a Heisman trophy winner in uh, Jaden Daniels last year. So shall stand for that. But um, you see, he's really struggling this year. I want to say that's the, that's what the third loss for LSU this year, I believe. Right. So it's third loss for LSU. They just got beat by a bad Florida team in the swamp. What does that say? And you're starting to hear uh, from the um, LSU media contingent. You even heard uh, last week from the Louisiana governor. He took a shot at the LSU uh, Tiger football program. And people are really not happy with Brian Kelly. And it's so funny because as Notre Dame fans, you know, we were all pretty uh, we were not upset at all when Brian uh, Kelly decided to move on uh, to, again, these quote unquote greener pastures. We weren't upset at that at all. But I'll tell you, me personally, as a Notre Dame fan, what I was upset about was that his uh, his coaching staff and that his former players had to hear that, uh, you know, online instead of hearing it from him. And then when they heard it, he gave a quick press conference the following morning. And I think he spoke to the team for less than five minutes. I, I didn't respect that at all. This is a team where all these players literally, you know, put their bodies on the line for you week in and week out. And, and you know, during during the summer when they were getting in the weight room for workouts and all that. And I'm not saying necessarily you owe them, but you owe them better than what you gave them. And that's five minutes to say, hey, I guess you heard. All right, I'm out. You know, and that's not cool. So anyway, all the LSU people, they thought we were just jealous that he was leaving and going to them. But it's funny because. Now they're seeing what it really is. And you're seeing reports if you're into college football about how uh, people in, around, in and around the LSU program don't like Brian Kelly. So every time he loses, we Notre Dame people, we just take probably an inordinate and maybe even unhealthy amount of joy in uh, watching that happen. So it was real cool to watch a bad Florida team 
beat uh, Brian Kelly and the LSU Tigers. So that was fantastic. So that's my uh, that's my quick hits on uh, college football. And um, uh, definitely wanted to uh, make sure I talked about that. Um, da, 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 da. So um, second quick hit. I'm not going to get too much into this because it's just kind of in talks. So we know that I, I know I've been one of the main people talking about the terrible state of the NBA, right? Because you get all these people, I know, and that's mo- for the most part younger people, but uh, you know, the millennials and the Gen Z or who, however you classify them. And they're always telling me, oh, Bruce, you're just an old head hater. Uh, the modern NBA, the players today are so much better. The NBA is so much better. And I keep saying it, the product is terrible. The product is terrible. The product is terrible. No one wants to listen to me, right? A big part of the reason why Le- the, the product is terrible, LeBron. Um, for instance, the all-star game and the all-star weekend, the all-star game has gotten terrible. Why? Guys don't want to compete. They're on all this friendly crap. They don't want to go out there and get busy. Back in the day, even guys who were friends were still going at each other in the all-star game, right? Again, nobody's saying that they should behave as if it's uh, game seven of the NBA finals, but you guys are making a lot of money. The fans are watching you go out there and compete. Give the fans something to see. Even beyond that, back in the day, uh, if you were an athletic player, a high flying player, what was what was kind of your unspoken responsibility as an NBA high flyer and added, uh, athletic player was to participate in the slam dunk contest. LeBron made it cool for those type of players not to participate in the slam dunk contest. Now, I know people because, oh, you're a hater, you're a hater. Why everything got to be LeBron? Because guys were doing it until LeBron decided that he wasn't going to. You can get mad at me all you want, but that is the case. All right. So so we know the glamour event of All Star Weekend, that's now pretty much, you know, turned to dust. And that's the uh, slam dunk contest. Now that's been taken over by the three point contest, because honestly, I don't even care about the slam dunk contest anymore. I want to see the three point contest and what's going to happen there. The All Star game itself in the NBA has almost gone to like turning into the Pro Bowl. In, in the NFL and the Pro Bowl, as you know, is now gone. They don't even play it anymore. So I don't I doubt that the all star game has too much longer to last. And the reason I bring this up as a quick hit, because I was reading an article and this is uh, Sports Illustrated online. And it says the headline is NBA in talks on bold new format for 2025 all star game in San Francisco. And first, the first thing I thought was, man, the NBA is in bad shape, right? And especially the All-Star Weekend. Why? Because they keep having to try and change and tweak and adjust this All-Star game to try and regain some interest, right? And remember a few weeks back, I did the show with President Obama and he flat out told Tyrese Halliburton like, yo, well, he didn't say you guys suck, but basically he's like, you guys aren't playing hard. You need to do something to fix this All-Star game because it's it's terrible and I'm not going to be watching anymore, right? And there are tons and tons of people who would echo that sentiment, who guys who are basketball fans who remember a better day and a better product in the NBA. And it's not just an in my day or, you know, old man yelling at clouds or, hey, you kids, get off my lawn. It's not just that, right? It's really, if you just look at it, you know, game for game, the product was better back then. And so anyway, what we have now, and we know this because Adam Silver was utterly disgusted by the state of the uh, NBA All-Star game for the last few of them, right? Last year before the All-Star game, I think it was in Indianapolis, uh, Larry Bird and Dr. J and those guys literally had to come into the locker rooms and try to beg these guys to compete. Now, are, are we serious? Like, who would have had to come into the locker room and beg Larry Larry Bird and Dr. J and Michael Jordan to compete? Man, those guys wanted to get out there and go get it. But, you know, that mentality doesn't exist today in these modern players. It's absolutely terrible. Um... Yeah, Sneed, you're 100% right. That's what happens when you cater to casuals that aren't loyal to the game. Snowflakes leave as quick as they showed up. That's a great analogy. I love that. Snowflakes hit the ground, they melt, they turn to water. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so um, it, it's terrible. So anyway, NBA in talks on bold new format. So what what is the, I guess, possibly uh, suggested possible new format? Um, Sham Sharania, NBA insider, uh, he says um, – The league, executives, coaches, and players have been in discussions to revamp the league's All-Star Weekend over the last six months, discussing a new format with the competition committee. And so the changes are set to be sweeping. Shams explains, with a new four-team tournament-style format consisting of three All-Star teams and the winner of the Rising Stars game, each All-Star team would reportedly consist of eight players each. So (laughs) that tells you 
they're they're just trying to come up with something at this point it almost seems like they're trying to get anything throw it on the wall see what sticks and try to get something to get people interested in the nba all-star game again and the fact that they have to do this and go through all of this stuff nba players should be ashamed and those same people who are telling me that the modern nba product is so much better man you can just hold that because we see that it's not they're trying so hard to come up with this stuff um let's see um lou what's going on notice none of these old heads say this about any sport besides the nba that's a fact that is a fact because in other sports lou as you know guys are still trying to compete right and it's we get it um we understand that the money is huge in the nba and when you're making that much money it's really hard to to get guys to compete right um i think i've said this on the show here before marvelous marvin Hagler, the great uh fighter rest god bless the dead he once said it's hard to get up and run six miles when you're sleeping in silk pajamas you know what i mean um lou also says adam silver and lebron james and his agency have totally ruined the nba the entitlement the narcissism acting like a diva above competition it's also filtered down lou you're 100 right i couldn't say it any better i don't have anything to add to that you're right um lou also says oh here we go <laughs> now with Bronny, it's like a bad joke lebron fans are basically people that eat at a horrible restaurant and defend it because it's the only place they ever ate at lou coming with the great analogies tonight you're kicking it lou you spitting fire bro get the fire extinguisher man don't burn your crib down i appreciate that though that's good stuff you're saying because it's true and i'll tell you real quick i'm not gonna let this devolve into a, a Bronny thing it's so interesting you literally have people saying like you got so much hate for that man lebron now you transferring it to Bronny, which is like utterly absurd and wild to me but you know that that's how that's how some of these people are but anyway that j so um yeah back to the quick hit what they're trying to do is basically take the all-star game and they're trying to do anything they can to save it because they know uh, that was a huge money maker for the NBA that whole weekend. Also, they're trying to um, I think they're trying to capitalize on the uh, three point shootout, which obviously we know is now the glamour event with the changes in the way the game is played, et cetera. That's the new glamour event of all star weekend. Last year, you had Steph Curry in a shootout against Sabrina Ionescu of the WNBA champion, New York Liberty, which was actually awesome because the year before in the WNBA three point shootout, Sabrina Ionescu she set the three-point shootout record for male or female with the most makes and she shot last year against steph head-to-head -head, and that was pretty cool steph ended up winning but it, it was really good and uh i think Ionescu was shooting from the men's line too the only difference was she was using the women's ball but so that, that was real cool and so now um they are looking to do let's see they're looking to do a, possibly a um nba and w nba versus wnba shootout so not just stephanie and Eskew, but maybe clay uh, thompson would be involved caitlin clark might be involved these are some of the things that you're hearing so we'll see what happens at the end of the day that that tells you that <laughs> steve you're a funny dude at the end of the day what does that tell you that tells you that the nba is in a bad place and they are desperate and they're trying to do every and anything they can do to find something to save this faltering product that's all there is to it all right um that's enough for the quick hits those quick hits took a little longer than i thought but you know you know me once i get going i get going but all right let's go um back to best of the nfc so we were talking about it we know what what an amazing and difficult conference the uh afc is now um we'll go over to the nfc right because the nfc obviously has uh they obviously have uh half of the super bowl right they have to have their representative and they have what i believe to be two outstanding teams that should they make it that far it could be very interesting but the question is for me i mean and we still have a few games left who's the best of the nfc and i think if you can look on the thumbnail you can see we got the philadelphia eagles and we have the uh detroit lions to me those guys those two teams excuse me are far and away the best that the nfc has to offer uh, both in terms of health and the way they're playing this year. I think that if the Bucs were healthy, that would be a dangerous, dangerous squad as well. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, the only loss the Lions have this year is to the Bucs earlier in the season, uh, right around the beginning of the season when um, when the Bucs were all healthy. Like, they can do it, man. Uh, Baker and Jerry Goff, that's pretty much a wash. And then, you know, you have uh, uh, Chris Godwin. When, when everyone's healthy, you have Chris Godwin and um, uh, Mike Evans. Uh, two elite receivers, and of course you got Bucky Irvin in the backfield, so on and so forth. The Bucks are a really good team when everybody's healthy. I think that's dangerous. 
Um, Sneed says it comes down to Hertz versus Golf. Yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly. Um, and that could be interesting. And I'm sure provided, you know, obviously we got to take health with a grain of salt in the uh, NFL. But Hertz versus Golf, uh, Golf, excuse me, if everyone is healthy, that's the NFC title game right there. Um, so we'll we'll see, man. I'm I'm definitely looking forward to it. But yeah, these are two uh, these are two outstanding teams. Uh, I like them both a lot in terms of being the uh, NFC representative, and I think either one would uh, give a hell of a battle to whoever comes out of the AFC. And if I'm not, it, to me personally, and I'm trying to be objective here, I think the AFC easily comes down to Kansas City and Baltimore. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, who knows? how long Kansas City can remain undefeated. Uh, man, the way they're playing football on both sides of the ball is crazy. And now you're adding special teams. These dudes are winning games with a field goal block. Absolutely out of this world. But uh, back to the NFC. So let's let's hear our guy, <laughs> Stephen A., kind of talk about uh, the Eagles and the Lions and um, what he thinks about them. So let's check that out. He was discussing this on first take, I think, yesterday. We're talking about the Eagles and Saquon Barkley for a while, and obviously I think the Detroit Lions are the best team in the NFC. When I think about the San Francisco 49ers, the absence of Brandon Ayuk is something that I think potentially will come back to haunt them, and I just feel that way about it. I ain't really worried about anybody else in the NFC West. I know we see Arizona doing some things, Kyler Murray doing his thing. Congratulations. I'm very, very touched by that. Uh, but Seattle came crashing down to earth after its fast start in the NFC North. We see Green Bay and Jordan Love, eh, you know. We know Dallas is going to be a non fact They ain't going to even make the playoffs. And the Commanders obviously went up against the Philadelphia Eagles and were humbled a bit, uh, dare I say, in the second half. We saw what transpired. It's not that there aren't good teams in the NFC. It's that I think that Detroit and Philadelphia has shown, particularly over the last six to seven weeks, that they are above the crowd in the NFC. So I think it's about them. I think it comes down to them. And that's where, that's where I'm at with it. Everybody talking about San Francisco. It's What I'm trying to say is very, very simple, y'all. You ain't going to pick anybody against Philadelphia and Detroit at this particular moment in time. Certainly this competition. Certainly anybody could lose on any given Sunday. I get all of that. But if you had to pick the two best teams in the NFC right now, it would be Detroit and Philadelphia. Okay, so uh, I definitely agree with what Stephen A. had to say there. Clearly uh, Detroit and um, Philadelphia – two best teams in the NFC. So you're looking at this thing, obviously Philadelphia eight and two, and they had a little bit of a um, rough patch earlier in the season. And at one point uh, you had Devonte Smith and uh, AJ Brown, both injured. And you could tell that um, that really hurt uh, Jalen hurts and what he was able to do. But Saquon Barkley has kind of been the constant for that team. That was uh, probably one of the, you know, if not the best, but the second best pickup in the in the offseason, Saquon to the Eagles and, of course, Derrick Henry to the Ravens. Both of those guys have been so key in uh, making the offenses on their respective teams go and just uh, watching what they're able to do, man, has been uh, absolutely incredible. I think Saquon is second in the league in rushing and he's closing in because uh, the last couple of games, Derrick Henry hasn't really gone off. We'll see if he's able to do that on Sunday against the Steelers, one of the best defenses in the league. So <laughs> that's going to be interesting. But uh, yeah, Saquon is really doing his thing. He's managed to stay healthy. He's averaging almost uh, six yards a carry, 5.8 yards a carry. He's got eight touchdowns and uh, 1,137 rushing yards, and he's doing his thing. Um, he's literally doing things, what, that we've never seen before in the NFL. He's able to – he's literally jumping over people backwards. is absolutely insane. Um, uh, yeah, he's he's doing a tremendous job. He also has uh, more than 200 yards uh, receiving, so averaging 9.1 yards uh, per catch. Got a couple of receiving touchdowns. So he is like – he is – just an incredible and versatile weapon on that roster. And then, of course, A.J. Brown and, and Devontae Smith uh, doing their thing as well. So really good. And, I mean, really, if you look at the rosters, probably, uh, oh, there's Georgia. They just took the lead on Tennessee. Another touchdown. Got to be careful with those guys. But anyway, um, if you look at the rosters line for line, uh, especially with Aiden Hutchinson out, I think that's really going to show itself when Detroit has to play against the better teams because that guy was a game wrecker whose motor never stopped. But uh, I think Philadelphia is just as talented, if not more talented, 
than Detroit is, but Detroit is just, uh, they, they almost seem to be playing on another level right now. The fact that, and don't get me wrong, uh, Philadelphia is uh, definitely better than Houston, but the fact that last game out, you saw Detroit, uh, Jared Goff throw five interceptions and they still won that game, managed to completely shut down the Detroit offense in the second half, like no points. That says a lot, man. Detroit is an extremely good football team. You can see they're extremely hungry from getting to the NFC Championship game uh, last year and then uh, not being able to get the job done and get to the Super Bowl and and have an opportunity to win the thing. So uh, I think that's just, man, that's an outstanding team. Uh, You know, I, I really, I have a hard time myself picking who I think is the best uh, team out of those two. It's really tough. It's almost one of those where I want to take the lazy way out and say, I got to see it on the field. Sneed says Barkley brings incredible dynamics to that offense. He is bonkers. Absolutely. You know what he kind of reminds me of, Sneed? Um, I don't know if it's quite the same thing. He's the he's like the Marshall Falk in The Greatest Show on Turf, what Marshall Falk was doing for the Rams. I see Saquon kind of in that mold doing a similar thing for the Eagles. I'm not saying he is Marshall Falk or he's as good, but he plays that similar role. And his ability to, yep, Shady McCoy, that's another. Uh, yeah, absolutely. He, we know he can catch it out of the backfield. He can even line up as a receiver. Obviously, he can run it tough between the tackles. Like, Saquon really doesn't have a weakness, and he's such a such a spark plug for that offense, man. It's really, really good. Uh, breakout playing in an instant. Yep, yep. Uh, Shady McCoy, that, that's a good analogy. That, that shows, man. I, I guess I'm just an old-school guy. I immediately went to a Marshall Falk or a, maybe a Thurman Thomas type. Like, that's that's what I see. Uh, with the Saquon and what he brings to to this offense. Um, yeah, man, they they are tough. They are tough. But then you look at the you look at the Lions. And I think maybe it might even come down to coaching. I think the Lions have better coaching. But um Sirianni also uh, coached those guys, those guys being the Eagles to a Super Bowl and literally within just a couple of minutes from winning the thing. So it, it is it is tough, man. I really don't know you know, where I go with this, but like recently, uh, so the first three weeks, check out the Lions, um, the Lions scores, right? They beat the Rams 26, 20. They lose to Tampa Bay, 20 to 16. They beat Arizona 20 to 13. Then they start putting up numbers, right? They beat Seattle 42 to 29. They beat Dallas 47, nine. They beat, uh, Minnesota 31, 29. They beat Tennessee 52 to 14. Beat Green Bay 24 to 14, Houston 26, 23. Like they can score. They can score with the best of them. That team, they got a lot. <laughs> they can score. And so you, you say, man, like obviously they have a defense good enough to stop you. They can score. Jerry Goff doesn't make a whole lot of mistakes. We know he played poorly that last game, but he generally doesn't make a whole lot of mistakes. So he's dangerous. I I really don't know. Who's the better team here? And I hate to be lazy and say I got to see it play out, but I I really don't know, man. Uh, the Lions are very creative on ops offense. Absolutely, Snead. Um, the way big, uh, not big Ben. I said big Ben. The way Ben Johnson uh, draws up on offense is is very good. Now, don't get me wrong. Having a lot, having a guy like uh, not a guy like having that elite offensive line allows you to do a lot more things. You can you can be almost disrespectful with all the trick plays and all that. You have more time to let things develop. Why? Because Jerry Goff is everybody who's back there is protected. And, you know, so you, you have arguably the best offensive line in the game. You can do those things, but uh, yeah, man, this, this is tough. Uh, let's see. Don't forget Detroit acquired Zadaria Smith. That is true. That is true. He's not quite, um, he's not quite, uh, uh, uh what's my man's name? Uh, Aiden Hutchinson, but he he's still legitimate a legitimate thresh that uh, a legitimate threat that can get to the quarterback and also demands that you pay him some attention in terms of uh, pass blocking and run blocking schemes. Like he can do it, man. He can do it. Uh, yeah, thanks, Need Hutch. Right. So um, yeah, Zadarius Smith definitely a good pickup. Um, Laker Nation says Saquon was a great pickup for the Eagles. Absolutely, absolutely. He's one of those guys, man, three down back. He can do it all, run between the tackles, catch it, flex out into the wide out position. So uh, very good. So I guess the whole point of it was who's the best of the NFC. That was the whole point of this topic. And so I am going to say I think the Lions are the best team in the NFC. I think they're playing the best in the NFC right now. However, if it came down to it, and I know this is, sounds crazy, if it came down to it, I trust the Eagles more. Jalen Hurts has been there and done that. 
Seriani has been there and done that. So they know what it takes to get to a Super Bowl and to be, you know, that close to winning. Obviously, they didn't win. I think I trust them just a little bit more. And then there's the issue of um, uh, not Ben Johnson. Uh, geez, I cannot remember the knee biter, Dan Campbell. There's the issue of him and the concern about him uh, making a possibly um, a call that could be detrimental to his team in the clutch because we've seen that before. So do we know that we can trust him? When it comes down to making the right decision, I do not know. I do not know. So, uh, yeah, I think Detroit is the better team. I think I trust Philly more, <laughs> if that says anything. So I guess if it were to come down to it, Philly plays Detroit. Uh, I guess they would have to go to Detroit if kind of things stay chalk as they are. Uh, I would say I'm going to go with Philly. I'm going to go with Philly. It's just something about them. And I think Saquon is that X factor. So I'm going to go Philly here. And I think Philly has a slightly better defense, too. So, yep, I'm, I'm going to go Philly, saying they're the best of the NFC. And I'm going to leave it at that. I'm going to put the number in the chat, 904-219-8264. 904-219-8264. Uh, if you have anything you want to add regarding that or uh, any pushback you have or any disagreement, um, if you think it, maybe it's another team in the NFC, uh, I'd love to hear that as well. So, yeah, give us a call. Tell, tell me what you think. Um, yeah. Yep. Let's get it. These playoffs are going to be super exciting. I, I can't wait. Quick side note, the playoffs are going to be super exciting in college and the pros. <laughs> so uh, if you love football, man, this is a fantastic time of year. And we've got some uh, some really great stuff going on. So I can't wait. I can't wait. All right, I'm going to give about another minute here. It doesn't look like I'm going to get another call on this. So I'm going to give another minute here. But while I'm waiting, uh, if you haven't already, I'd appreciate if you uh, make sure you go and uh, click like and subscribe on the channel. Appreciate that. It helps us out. And uh, make sure you're sharing the channel. Like I always say, the share button is powerful. And, um, yes, it is a great year for Football Laker Nation. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, um, we will be back with you. Providing something else big doesn't happen in the world of sports. Be back with you uh, Wednesday night, and uh, we'll talk. Okay, here we go. Main man, Bruce. Bruce, what's going on, man? Hey, what's up, man? Hey. Yes, sir. As far as the NFC, as far as the NFC it's mm -hmm. Detroit. Detroit is the new power of the NFC. Okay. San Francisco time has passed. Them. They, they had their shot. They, they've been in the AFC Championship. How many times? How many times they've been to the Super Bowl in the past six years? Twice. They always in it. Right. Um... Yeah, this Detroit, this is Detroit. Uh, the NFCs will be ran by Detroit for the mm -hmm. next four or five years, I believe. Okay. So they proved it last year with it. My bad, on. They proved it last year with Dan Camp. You want to go for every goddamn down in the next <laughs> yeah. game. Like, what the hell? You had him. You had your throat. That was some bone. I understand his aggression. I love Dan Camp. He you break, you're breaking up, Bruce. You hear me now? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, go ahead. You hear me? Yeah. Yes. Detroit is the power in, in, in NFC right now. They will run the NFC for the next four or five years. San Francisco time. Maybe. Uh, green, you know, um, yeah. Uh, you know, Damn, you, you're going uh, in and out, bro. Hold on. Hold okay. on. You hear me now? Yeah, I'm sorry, bro. You. you hear me? No, no, you good. I can hear you. Yeah, so this, the NFC right now is Detroit domain. They will run the NFC right now. Detroit is the power of the NFC. Mm -hmm. San Francisco time has passed. Them. Right. They had their chances. It's over for them. It's Detroit. You know, they running. They running hard. They they, they got uh they call them Sonic and Hitchhog. Uh, mm -hmm. Sonic and, and nothing. Yeah, Detroit. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Detroit got everything you need. To <laughs> Detroit is basically, well, I think the Detroit is basically the Ravens of the NFC East. I mean, NFC, basically, if you want to. So can I ask you something about, about Detroit? Yeah, go ahead. So, go ahead so. Um, do me a favor. Mute the mute YouTube in the background. I can hear the echo. I don't have you. That's the thing. I ain't got YouTube. You hear me now? I don't have it on in the background. Oh, that's, that's weird. Oh, okay. Um, but anyway, uh, let's, let's, so, so here's the deal, right? I'm going to say, I'm going to ask you, I should say, what makes you so sure that Detroit is ahead of Philly in the NFC? 
I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just asking you, like, how you came to that decision. Continuity. Mm -hmm. Consistency. Togetherness. There's a brotherhood. They respect that coach. Philadelphia don't respect Sirianni right now. Every week they talk about he on the hot seat. So that's why I said they, Detroit got everything clicking for him right now. I'm not mad at that. I mean, I, I think Philly is playing very well right now as well, but I'm not mad at you saying Detroit. I'm not. Uh, I just wanted to kind of know what your thought was. And it's, yeah, it's funny. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sirianni, is, he, he's shaky. Mm-hmm. They don't. They have don't even like him on that team. <laughs> right. They don't. Most definitely don't got the utmost respect for him. Like Detroit players got the utmost respect for uh, Dan Campbell. They they will run through the wall for Dan Campbell, man. I can agree with that. Detroit had that they put him in the Super Bowl last year. What up, Dan Campbell trying to be too man too aggressive? Mm-hmm. But you know what they say: take the risk or lose the chance. Right. That's right. That's right. They put. They had too much fear. They had too much fear in San Francisco, and they was they was rolling on them in the NFC Championship. Why are you doing? Get this. Get the point. Yeah, yeah. They already the had them by like three touchdowns. What's going on, man? Mm-hmm. I let them in the game. I guess they feared their defense wasn't going to be able to hold up against Purdy in them in the second half. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Understand what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I hear it. I hear. It. Yeah, no, yeah, I'm, yeah, man, I'm not true. mad at that. I, I, that's I, why I got. I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. That's why I got Phil, that's why I got Detroit better than Philly. The continuity, the respect, the honor. They they run to the wall fake coach. You know, Philadelphia shaggy right now. Okay. Understand what I'm saying? That's 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 how basically how I feel right now. Yeah, but I got Detroit, yeah. Most definitely. Right. San Francisco time is up. It's over for them. It's Detroit, it's the, it's the beast of the east. NFC. So, All right. Yeah. There All we right. go. All right. All right, brother. I appreciate the call, Bruce. Thank you, man. All right. All right. No doubt. No. All right, so uh, Bruce has Bruce has uh, Detroit being the new beast of the East, and again, I'm not mad at that. I'm just saying I think there's an argument for Philly. Detroit's eight and one, you know, Philly's eight and two. Like I think there's a legit argument. Let's take this call from uh, Laker Nation. Detroit's eight and one. Laker eight Nation two, is like, good. I think Hello? Yeah, I had, okay. can you hear me? Yes, sir. I wasn't gonna call in. You ain't gonna disrespect my Niners like that, bro. <laughs> I don't. I, I, well, I mean, I think, I think that there's a legitimate argument for saying that the the Niners' time might be done. And the reason why I'll say I think there might be an argument for that is because uh, what's his name? Um, who's your receiver? That uh, Ayuk. I think he's done for the year, right? Bro, L- listen, listen. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Listen up. This doesn't mean because I last call it said it like fifteen times. I was gonna let the first. I let the first four slide. Look, I don't make excuses. Um, yeah, we hit. It started in the Super Bowl. You know with the injuries. You know that was a big clog in our defense. But CMC just got back. Our we still have a shot with our division. Mm-hmm. Um, this is going to be one of those, you know, get a good draft pick, a solid draft pick year, and retool year to see what pieces is working and what needs to be reshaped. Mm-hmm. Um, they're going to be, uh, we're, you know, he's our Mister Lynch has been. Doing a very good job instructing the team. You know, I didn't like a lot of moves. I wanted them to be a little bit more aggressive, but he has shown that, that he's patient and making making the, the correct moves. Uh, Purdy is still developing. Um, they've been, you know, saying that they're done means means like they're done. They're they're not going to be a factor no more going forward. They need to they need to. You know, Gut the team and start over scratch. No, they don't. I don't. No, I don't. I don't think it means that. I think it means that seeing them as the class of the conference and being almost penciled in to the conference title game regularly. I think that is has passed. I think that's what he's saying. And but here's the deal, right? Obviously, I can't speak for him, but I think that's what he's saying. So here's the other thing, right? After this season, you got to play pay Brock Purdy. So now it's okay if you give him the contract that he deserves and that he has earned. 
that starts affecting who else you can keep on the team. So I think all those are things we need to take into account. I'm sitting back to wait and see. Um, what's his name? Uh, Shanahan has been able to have a very effective team no matter who is on the roster. So we will see. Uh, I'm not one of those people that believes Brock Purdy is just a system guy and that he's just plugging. I don't believe that at all. I think he's legitimately really, really good quarterback, probably a top seven guy in this league. And um, obviously from what he's done this far, he deserves a max deal. And so I'm waiting to see right. how that's going to play out. So he going to get on. I, I hate this salary cap in the NFL. Like, it, it, it handcuffs a lot of teams while a lot of their stars, they can't keep a lot of their key pieces, which we don't have dynasties anymore. It doesn't have to, though, um, Laker Nation. It doesn't have to. It's a matter of if the if the owners want to properly manage the cap, right? There's um uh, Andrew Brent is a former GM for the Green Bay Packers, and I, I think he's got uh, a sub stack or he's got a thing that he writes. And he um he was on The Odd Couple more than a few times. And one of the things he was saying he says it's BS when they tell you that you can't keep everybody. It's just a matter of how you manage the cap and where you put the money. So, for instance, if I want to, uh, let's say, you know, I'm the star quarterback and they just paid me and you're the star rush end and they got to pay you. It can be done if the owner is willing to turn some of my contract into a bonus money and give it to me up front. Right. But a lot of owners, they don't want to do that because you got to pay that money up front. So. It's a matter of what the owner is willing to do and what they're willing to pay or not pay, whether or not they can keep a team together, how they construct the contract. So if you have really good cap people and you have an owner that's willing to pay, then you can make things happen. So we'll see. Well, yeah, it comes, it comes down to the owners. You know, that NFL is all about that profit. That's right. That's right. But the, high, but the highest paid people on your team should always be number one. Your quarterback, number two, that left tackle, and three, your edges. Yes, I agree. Those always should be your highest paid, and everyone else um, work it out. <laughs> get, they, you work it out, and yeah. you get what you what you deserve. Like mm-hmm, you mm-hmm. can't be. I'm saying you a star receiver, and you're like I want. I'm talking about my are you. Yeah. I'm saying you want twenty million, and, and what he, he was like, what was he? He got for an astronomical number. Um, but okay, so we play, we pay you then. Okay, so what about okay, we pay you that 20 million. Okay, we have to cover the other teams of series. How are we going to pay our DBs? Mm-hmm. That's going to deplete our secondary, that's going to make our other side of the ball weak. You so, know, you got to have a solid middle line, you got to have a solid middle li- linebacking core to help stop the run for teams like the Eagles, teams mm-hmm. like the Lions mm-hmm. that got that speed on the edge. You need linebackers that can that can cover side to side. No doubt, you know, and I agree. So that that's right. when the, so you got two things you need to have. Then you need to have a really good capologist. You need to have a, an owner that's willing to pay if you got to put some of that money in bonuses so that it doesn't hurt you against the cap. And you have to have really competent scouting to draft the right guys. Because if you got to let somebody go, you have to be able to get the right guy out of the draft that can be. Uh, a regular and hopefully relatively immediate contributor. So that way I mean, you can keep been, younger guys on your team that can do it. And I'm not saying that the Niners don't. I'm just saying those are what you need to have to, yeah, be able I, to make it happen. That's absolutely true. That's absolutely true, but the Niners have done that. Yeah. And that's why I yeah. said um, the front office has got – is better now than it's been in the past. Mm-hmm. So they have been doing that. The scouting has been top notch. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We have they have been patient. They don't just make moves just to make moves. You know they've been patient. You know what they if the guy they needed is not available. You know okay, they'll build they build up what they have, um, and then they'll, they'll try to get their guy in the next year. Mm-hmm. So like they hit a home run with Debo. He fits the offense yeah. perfectly. Yep. They hit a home run with the trade with CMC. They mm-hmm. fell into place. They they did that. That's right. Um now they gotta home look at George Purdy. Kittle. <laughs> you know. But now they got we gotta look at George Kittle he's slowing down. That's what I was about to say. The question is, so, do you pay that guy and keep him? He's slowing down, he's getting nicked up. I mean he's that's a what, very that's good player, you, but that's when you say you gotta be somebody with smart strategic with the money. You can't pay this guy with, Oh, you can't pay a player for what he's done. You got to pay a player by what That's he's right. going forward. That's right. And realistically, See? you can get a quality tight end out of college, though. You know, uh, yeah. to, to that point, George Kittle's from Iowa. Look at Iowa. 
look at Notre Dame. Like uh, there's schools where you, Wisconsin, you know, Ohio State, um, uh, Georgia, Alabama. There's schools that are very good at producing certain positions. You can get a tight end. You can get it. So a lot like, of you don't have to. And, with, mm-hmm. and I was going to say with this new 12 team playoff, a lot of players are going to get known. And this draft That's is right. going to be the draft when it comes to like skilled players to mm-hmm. plug holes on these playoff contending teams. Mm-hmm. They're going to find a lot of key pieces coming up in these next in these next few drafts. Because the right. kids that I'm seeing now, I don't know all their names, but I think the, the, the kids I see now that's coming out next year and the year after and the year after that, man, mm-hmm. there's some solid skill players. I agree. I agree. They may not be home runs like stars, but there's some solid skill players that can plug in and, and you know, plug those holes for the salary cap on these playoff teams. Mm-hmm. That's, why I, that's why I disagree. I don't think that the Niners aren't out of it. No, I don't think so either. You know, you can't get George Lynch, and George Lynch has been doing a phenomenal job as a GM. Yeah, John Lynch, yeah. Um, yeah, you're right. Owners, the owner seems to, it, it seems to like the moves and buying in on it. Mm-hmm. You know, he ain't, He's not doing Jerry Jones type shit. <laughs> but um, nobody's doing Jerry Jones type stuff. Except Jerry but, Jones. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I think the what's going to help the Cowboys. They just need to move on from Dak Prescott, move CD Lamb to get some pieces for that, and um, just 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 move just just move forward. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, they stuck they stuck in their old ways or worked in the past. It's not working. Anymore. They need to move forward. That's but, right. To go with what you're saying, I um I agree the top the top two as of right now is the Lions and the Eagles. Yeah. However, we still got eight weeks left. That's right. Um I like the commanders. They're young, they're hungry. Um I like the Vikings. They're being they're solid, their defense is, is top notch. All right, let me interrupt uh, you real quick. So the commanders, young, hungry, athletic, well coached, but they haven't shown yet that they can beat the better teams that they have to play. So there's still some growth that needs to happen. I didn't say they were the top in the NFC. No, I got you. you. They're they're moving moving in the right direction. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You're 100% Um, right about that. Um, We're on the NFC right right now. You can't count out Green Bay. No, you cannot. Um, Um, Real quick, when you mentioned the Vikings, though, the Vikings have a fantastic defense, but I do not believe in Sam Darnold. Uh, He has clearly regressed since the season started. They got more tape on him now, and all of a sudden, he doesn't look like that guy anymore. But, so, I, I was so just waiting. You, I knew it was going to happen. But when you're top, when your defense is top, is, is top in the league, really doesn't matter. Uh, it matters, um, but it helps a lot. It covers up a lot. But I get what you're saying. It helps, but it doesn't matter. He just got to manage. Mm-hmm. He just got to manage. Um, he just got to manage. Um, the de- he just got to manage the offense. You know, mm-hmm. you know, get let the defense get rest, put some points on the board. Um, so with solid defense, a field goal is a t- is like a touchdown. Mm-hmm. Um, so the only way they'll get in trouble is they, if they run against a high octane offense that they can't contain, like the Chiefs, for instance, or if they go up against a team like the Ravens and they can't stop that run, then that's when they're going to be in trouble. Right. Um, right. But other than that, everyone else is just, you know, trying to figure out what they trying to figure out in the NFC what they what they all about. Yeah, I agree. You know, even though like even Tampa, like what is their identity this year? It's tough. If they were healthy, that would be one of the elite passing offenses in the league. But the injuries, man, the injuries are a killer. I can attest to that. I'm not using that as an excuse, but I'm just like even with all the injuries that we're dealing with. Mm-hmm. We still have a shot to win our division. That's true. Even That's though true. our division is not the is not the best in the league, but mm-hmm. but the Rams, Seattle, and all them, they have had quality wins and they played people tough. Mm-hmm. So you can't just the NFC the NFC West is not in the dirt. No, not at all. So we do have a, we do have a shot. As long as we don't get no more than two more losses in the year, we will be <laughs> <laughs> right. we, will, we will we will be um in the playoff discussion. If we get more than two, then I'll just watch the season off and I'm like, well, let's get ready for next year. <laughs> that's right, that's right. I wasn't even gonna call twice, but I couldn't let the blasphemy about my nine <laughs> keep going, man. Yeah, I, I can't be doing my boys like that. That's all good, man. You call anytime you want, brother. <laughs> all right, my brother. All right, man. I appreciate you, Laker Nation. I appreciate you too, man. Stay blessed. All right, man. Have a good night. You too. 
All right, team. I uh, appreciate that call for Laker Nation. Always got, got something good to say. All right, team. So what we're going to do, man, we are going to leave it right there. Uh, make sure you are, you know, subscribed and liked and uh, notification bell, all that good stuff. And uh, we'll get back with you uh, Wednesday night. And uh, hopefully G and Transform will be back with me. But if not, hey, you know, I'm perfectly capable of doing this thing for Dolo. Uh, I did it. I did it Dolo for years. And uh, it obviously, it's great to have my guys with me. But, you know. If I got to go back to the old school, I can do that, too. So y'all have a great night, man. Um, enjoy the second half of this uh, Tennessee-Georgia game. It looks like it's uh, going to be down to the wire. And, uh, yeah, have a great one. And I'm out. Peace.